And I remember the gods of science, uh, Frank Press at MIT and Maurice Ewing and all of that. And I was, I, was an under, I was the only guy there without a PhD. I was a graduate student telling, because I was using Alvin for my uh, PhD work in the Gulf of Maine, uh, using it as, as a Jeep for field geology. And I would never forget uh, giving a presentation on how it could be a really good field operating system in the mid-ocean, mid-Atlantic Ridge. And I'll never forget Frank Press standing up and say, tell me one thing Alvin had done significantly in science. Well, as I told you, it hadn't done much at about that time. And, and it was Bruce uh, Leyendijk, who had just got his PhD from Scripps. And if you know anything about Bruce, very cocky guy, stood up and he challenged Frank Press. He said, don't blame it on Alvin, blame it on the academic community for not wanting, coming up with a clever way of doing it. And I'll never forget that evening at, the, at dinner, Maurice Ewing was sitting across for me, and if you knew anything about Maurice Ewing, he was a towering figure at the time, and sort of not a necessarily a pleasant person. And uh, <laughs> he looked at this graduate student over, and he, he pointed his finger at me, and he says, look, young man, we're going to recommend to the academy that we do Project Famous, but if you fail, we're going to take your damn submarine, and we're going to turn it into a million titanium paper clips. <laughs> and, uh, so there was the gauntlet. Well, as you know, I, I sort of like gauntlets. And that led really to Project Famous, which began in 1972. And this was at the time when NSF had more innovative thinking than it does right now. They created the international decade for ocean exploration. I argued for the century, but we only got a decade. But during that decade, Look at all the discoveries that were made during NSS International Decade of Exploration. Everything I'm talking about tonight, all of this discovery of black smokers, and on the list goes, because scientists were unleashed to be more exploratory in their thinking. And that led to Project Famous, which was a truly amazing program. But what was really interesting is, it was almost like we were going to the moon. The kind of preparation that went into those first dives were staggering. The entire academic community, not only of the United States and France, but Canada and England and everyone rallied to bring every toy they had to prep this area on the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, just south of the Azores, was considered, quote, a typical spreading cell. And everything was thrown into the breach. The first guys in were, we convinced the Navy, which had a I was able to help on that. The Navy had a highly classified mapping system called the SAS system. And that was a 91 degree beams, 91 degree beam system. And they then would, uh, they could take 15 degrees either side of the center beam. So they could take a 15 degree roll without loss of 60 beams. So you had 91 degree beams and they were able to make phenomenal bathymetric maps. It's the first time the Navy ever showed the academic community that you could make highly precise maps. And that first one was done by the Bowditch. Uh, Joe Phillips here at the Oceanographic, working with Hank Fry at the Naval Research Lab, got them to do an unclassified uh, mapping of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and finally gave us maps that were just staggeringly accurate. Then we got the British to come in with Gloria, and Gloria had a, multi, a very low frequency side scan sonar where the swath width was 14 kilometers swath width. Now with that, we were able to get the grain, not the you know, range versus resolution, we had to a lot of the resolution, but we could get the grain of the, of the mid-Atlantic ridge in that area, followed by uh, NRL's Liebeck system, the light behind the camera system that could take gigantic photographs, I'll show you those, and then finally coming in with Angus, which was the dope on a rope, uh, but it was really the one that uh, was the fairly pioneering work of Angus that you'll hear more about in a few seconds. This is some of the Liebeck images, and this is where we had a gymnasium where we took all the photographs and laid them on the floor, and the scientists were crawling around looking at uh, the, the, where that person is right now is the very central volcano called Monte de Vines, and that was the spreading center of the volcano that we were going to focus on in Project Famous. But it was really amazing how much energy all of the people that 
were going to dive, went to the Assault Rift, they went to Hawaii. We went through astronaut training, really. The whole dive team, both the French and American team, spent two years going and looking at geologic settings that might be just for these dives. It was quite amazing what went into that first effort. And then they threw the, all the vehicles they, we had in our quiver at the time, which was Alvin, of course, with its new titanium hull. The Archimede, which is a bathyscath operated by the French Navy. One of my early, my first dive was in the mid-ocean ridge was with the French. I was on the French dive team. I dove in that one and we had a fire down at 9,000 feet, electrical oh. fire. And uh, when you have an electrical fire, you get all this black smoke. And then they had a rebreather, and, and, uh, and you, had to, you had to inhale the cabin air into the rebreather and then rebreathe it. So I had to fill the rebreather full of black smoke and then rebreathe it. I'm sure my lungs love that. But I'll for never forget that when, when the fire broke out, they turn off the oxygen to kill the fire, and that sort of kills you. And so. <laughs> Everyone's scrambling for their rebreathers, and I grab my rebreather and I put it on, and I've inflated it, and and I'm breathing, but I'm I'm getting really really dizzy, and I I'm a, I've done a lot of dive, scuba diving, and I thought, well, I'm just hyperventilating, I'm nervous, I'm so I went into skip breathing, which is where you try to calm yourself down by breathing every other time, and I wasn't working, and I was getting dizzy, and I taking my rebreather off to see what was around. They thought I was panicking. They were pushing it back on top of me. And then finally, the Harris Mundi, the pilot, who was a Basque uh, uh, French naval officer, went, oh, pardon, Bob, pardon. <laughs> he turned on my oxygen. <laughs> so instead of returning my salute as an officer, every time I saw him since, he went, pardon, Bob, pardon. <laughs> That became our new salute. But anyway, and then we had the Siana, which was designed after Cousteau's Suscoop. So all three of these vehicles then were committed to the battle, in the first with the Bathus Gath Archimede in the summer of 73, and then followed with all three of them in Project Famous when we went into the into the into uh, the spreading center that had been pounded to death with everything we could imagine. Now, even at that time. One of the research objectives of our program was to find hydrothermal vents or hot springs. We never used the word hydrothermal vents. We were looking for hot spring because we were looking for the Delta T I'll talk about in a minute that drove us to Galapagos too. We, so, but they thought the best place to look for them would be in the fracture zones. Now, if they'd gone up, they might have seen a lost city, but they were in the fracture zones looking where they thought the springs would be. They didn't think the springs would be along the, the central axis. So they, we went in there, and obviously they didn't find them. Uh, but then, I'll, I'll never forget the one dive we made where I think they went a little too hard try, trying to find hot springs when uh, Jack Donnelly, uh, Brian, uh, 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 Let's see, it was Jim Moore, Bill, Bill, Bill Bryan, and Jack Donnelly went a little too far into a fissure. And, and as you go in with Alvin, is very different on how you come out of Alvin, come out. So Alvin goes in and out. And so it went in, but then out was, it came straight up and got wedged. And, and this, is, this is at the moment, I'm talking to Alvin. I didn't know the photographer was photographing because they were having, I'm following them. I was service controller and I was following Alvin's movements across the plotter there. And we had set up a dive profile. It was going to go wall to wall. And it was, it was it, and when it stopped, it would make a big ink block. And it would just make a lot of ink and there would be a big blot. And then it would move and move and move. And, and so I saw these little ink patterns. And then there was this one just doing this. And I called down and I says, you guys, if you're going to get to the east wall, you need to get going. And the message back from Jack Donnelly was, we're trying. <laughs> and I went, trying. And they were stuck. And they were in the, in the, in the fissure. And what they fortunately was a really fresh lava. And so what Jack simply did was he sat in there with Alvin and just banged back and forth with Alvin breaking down the glass 
lava till he could get free. And we had the most amazing oriented rock samples you could ever get <laughs> buried in the syntactic foam. But when Paul Fye saw the original illustration in National Geographic that showed Alvin completely entrapped in the fissure, he stopped the presses at National Geographic and said, remove, I want to see water between Alvin and the fissure. And they had to pull the plate and literally modify the plate to make water because the original one had the rocks over the top of Alvin. And he said, no, I want water. And that cost geographic a fortune. But anyway, but that was then really uh, the precursor of, of, of what was leading up to our expedition to Galapagos. Now, Galapagos was a faster spreading system, so they thought maybe one of the reasons they weren't finding significant circulation uh, as, or any uh, evidence of water circulation uh, in the, in the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge was it was a slower spreading, two and a half centimeters per year versus six. So maybe it's because it just doesn't have the heat budget, and now we all know that's baloney because they found black smoke on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. But the idea of thinking back then was let's go to a faster spreading system. And there had been a lot of preliminary work. Scripps had been in there. They picked up temperature anomalies with deep toe. And so there was a lot of evidence. But the, so when we began to formulate the team that would go to make up the 1977 team, a lot of them came with totally you know, different agendas. Uh, the one that, that I was working mostly with was with Dick von Herzen. And Dick von Herzen, one of the biggest questions we always had is, as geophysicists and geologists was why was the Mid-Atlantic Ridge a positive feature? I mean, remember back then, uh, every member of my thesis committee was against plate tectonics. So it's, you got to be a little dicey as a graduate student when you're presenting a program on plate tectonics and every one year thesis committee members doesn't believe in it. So it's, a, it's sort of a, an interesting dance. But uh, I can never forget, they say, okay, young, they always call me uh, the white tornado in my Navy uniform. But anyway, they call me the white tornado. And they said, I understand how you make mountain ranges by colliding plates. Got that. How do you make a positive feature under tension? And that was a very good question. You know, because whenever you pull anything apart in civil engineering, it'll tell you 10% extension before failure, and then it, you know, it thins and then fails. How do, you, how do you make it bigger when you're pulling it apart? And it was actually Le Pichon and at Lamont and Franchiteau at Scripps who were first to suggest that the mid-ocean ridge was a cooling curve. There was really a reflection of water absorption through serpentinization, and that it was also a thermal welt and that it owed its topography to heat and water, not due to thickening of the crust through collision. And so then von, von Herzen proposed to go out and test that theory. And he did it in the southern, uh, southern Pacific, the southern Atlantic. And it was, the idea was to run along here and take a temperature probe, dropping a temperature probe from the surface, and he was predicting what the heat flow would be as a function of age. That as this thermal welt cooled, it lost its heat, it also condensed back to a denser slab, and that it, he could tell you, he could predict in advance what the thermometer, the, the heat probe would, should say. What was the heat flux as a function of time? Now, faster cells, a faster spreading centers, but he concentrated on the color, not the distance. He functioned on the age. And then he began a seminal cruise across the South uh, Atlantic Mid-Ocean Ridge, and every place he measured, it was, it was, it was equal to what he predicted. So he, he I said, I'll tell you what the heat flux will be, and it was dead on, dead on, dead on, dead on, not on. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was hot, his probes here had high temperature, but they weren't hot enough. We had our focus, what we call the delta T problem. Where's the missing heat? And when you have a theory where you're 90% right, you sort of think, well, it ought to be 100% right. Well, why was it wrong? Well, in hindsight, when you look at it, he's up there 6,000 feet above throwing a dart down there. And how are you going to hit a hot spring? So when we began going through multiple hypotheses of what could it possibly be, 
the candidate was there had to be hot springs. So the word we always use was hot springs. So what we were looking for was the Delta T. So what did we think? When we go back to what we, when Dick von Herzen saw our images uh, in Project Famous, oops, he fixated on the fissures. He said, they're all over the place. And I said, yeah, they're all over the place. He said, that's where you're gonna find a hot spring. So what did we think we were gonna encounter? We thought we were gonna go out and we we're gonna dive down and we we're gonna find a crack and it was gonna be shimmering water coming out of it, end of story. We had no thought about what was in the water other than heat. So that's what we were thinking. So we're gonna go out, we're gonna drive along the valley to a faster spreading center that has a higher heat budget and we're gonna find a crack and we're gonna find water coming out of it and we're gonna solve the Delta T. It was, anything else was not in our NSF proposal. So as you know, it was a little more than that. But anyway, so we came out of my job was to take the Angus system, which was a dope on a rope. This was on a trawl wire with three big benthos, four, 400 uh, foot, uh, 35 millimeter cameras. We had to figure out how to process 100,000 photographs with very little fresh water. We had to do the whole chemistry on doing them in salt water. So we had a big deal with geographic to figure out how to process all this film. But it was really our job was to break off, we were towing Lulu, because you had to tow Lulu out of, uh, out of the Panama Canal of, of Rodman. And then we broke off the tow, and then our job was to steam ahead of, of Lulu with the NOR, put in a transponder navigation system, because we had to use transponder navigation back then to figure out where the heck we were, and then to use that transponder navigation system to then, to then run uh, lines down the axis. So here's the, we got the, I was able to convince the Navy again to free up a classified ship. Uh, this time it was the uh, uh, Dutton. And we got the US, USNS Dutton to go in and make us a map. Uh, now we have them on our ships, they're called Kongsberg's EM-302s, but in fact we didn't have that kind of stuff. So I talked the Navy into making us a map. And they went in and made a highly detailed map, and then we used that to position our transponders. We called all our transponders after the seven dwarfs, so we had dopey, sleepy, grumpy. <laughs> uh, so all, all of our transponders that we put up on the hills, we put all our transponders up in the hills looking down into the, into the rise, and then we used that, and then with that we began running our lines. So now we wanted to run parallel to strike so we didn't hit scarps, so we did all our running lines down the axis of the valley so we weren't taking on vertical. We bounced around a lot. I mean, Angus was really just constantly getting smacked. We, in fact, one trip, one lowering, we went down, we were towing it behind the Nor, and we came up short on it. Now, this is not telling us anything except temperature. So we anchored literally what, when we, pro fortunately we got it back and we processed the films and we realized that we went over a big fissure and we're only seeing down. All we see is what's underneath us. And we're, we're watching our altitude. And to get a good color photograph, we had to fly at four meters, four meters above the bottom to get a good picture. And so we were constantly crashing. And it was, we, we have actually had a nickname. It takes a licking but keeps on clicking. And, uh, <laughs> and, we would, and what happened was we came over a big fissure and the bottom fell away, and the operator only saw the bottom fall away, didn't know he was in a fissure, so he went down. He was chasing the bottom, and then he came up short, and he literally shoved it in the fissure walls and anchored the nor. <laughs> and then we had the tensiometer just going screaming on us, and so you just pay out cable. until you, So we just started pouring out cable and laying it on the bottom of the ocean until we could get the nor and the cycloids, and we then retraced the path with the NOR and pulled it out. And then when we processed the film that night, we saw, the, we saw what happened, and we saw all these rocks going by the camera. You know, it was really pretty frightful. But anyway, <laughs> but we did have one active, sen we had two active sensors on it. We knew our altitude, and we knew we, could, we uh, were able to measure uh, an anomaly to a hundredth of, of a degree centigrade. And we then began seeing these. We started seeing these anomalies that were tr transmitted back to us. So we knew the time. So we knew the precise time we saw them. 
And then we also, because of transponder navigation, we knew where we were when we saw them. And so then we brought the sled back up and we processed all the film and then we could actually look at what we saw. And the terrain, just to give you a sense of the terrain we were working in, was pretty dramatic. I mean, they were, these were everywhere, these big gyas that we, we were used to them in Project Famous. But what we were not used to, uh, we were all used to pillow, pillow lavas. So we'd never see, the only time we ever saw fluid flows was on a very short dive the year before on the Bathyscath Trieste II when I went down into the Cayman Rise at 20,000 feet. We saw our first sheet flows, real fluid flows. And then we saw these lava lakes. I mean, it was really the volume of lava that was pouring out there compared to what we had seen in Famous was truly impressive. But can you imagine trying to fly around that and always stay four meters above it? I mean, it was pretty remarkable. Just to give you a sense of comparison of the two systems. So that's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And that's the East Pacific rise. And it's because the spreading, the spreading of the plates pulled the topography out. So this is able to pull it much faster out and you get these big fluid. This is not a photograph underwater. This is in the Assal Rift, which is very, is a piece of mid-ocean ridge that's under, uh, that's in the Assal uh, Rift is in uh, the country of Djibouti. Uh, but it's a piece of mid-ocean ridge. It's, it's under, below sea level, but the ocean hasn't claimed it yet. And this is one of the places we went in preparation for Project Famous was to go in and actually walk on real ocean floor. Uh, because we were below sea level and there was a dam just up, you know, once that dam goes, the African Rift Valley becomes an ocean. But to this moment, it's still not. Uh, but there's, uh, you can literally walk on the, on the ocean floor. And you can stand there and see that view you can never see underwater. Sit on the, on the, on the, on the uh, rift uh, walls and look down into a valley you could, only, you could never see. And this is one of those eruptions we filmed when we were there, these huge fluid flows. But then that was the magic moment. The, the scene in our film, clams. Now, as I said, Scripps had been ahead of us. And Scripps had, had picked up temperature anomalies and they had seen some, they were using deep toe. And deep toe is more of a geophysical toe system and it doesn't like getting near the bottom. It's, it, 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 takes, it doesn't go smack and smile. It goes smacks and loses lots of stuff. So it wasn't designed like Angus. Angus was a wrecking ball. Its job was just go in there and probably modify the train and then make it different. But, he, but, but Scripps's deep toe flew very high, measured magnetically, measured bathymetrically, and then it had a, once in a while, it would fly down, and it, it, it lowered a, a light bulb down, and then it would go down, take a picture, and go up. So but most of the time, it wasn't in visual contact. So what had happened was Scripps had seen temperature anomaly when they were high. And then they were doing one lowering. They came down, and this was really crazy. They saw a bunch of dead clams and a pair of tennis shoes. <laughs> I kid you not a pair of tennis shoes and we're going, and, and they called it clam bake. Because they thought someone had had a clam bake through every, over, everything overboard, and then plus some tennis shoes. <laughs> and they hadn't put the two together because they too weren't thinking there was any biological connection to the Delta T problem. And so they had seen a dead one and it was just dissolving clam shells but it had no temperature anomaly associated with it. So they, they, didn't, they didn't connect the dots. So when we went in, we be then began mapping. And from that, we were able to begin looking at the types of terrain. Uh, uh, and, and this is the spreading, central spreading axis. So this is the, 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 the south wall, the, the north wall. And this is our, what we were geologically building a geologic map. And then we finally created a full geologic map based upon uh, over 100,000 color images, and all of these are the events that we found in 1977. And so they were literally above the magma chamber on an erupted, just like, uh, just like Dick Von Hertzen thought that the vents would be right above the magma chamber on an active fissure, and that's exactly where they were. And then we, now this, then Alvin showed up. So we'd actually found everything, and then Alvin showed up, and we knew exactly where to send it. 
because it had the same transponder tracking system. So we simply could call over and give them an X, Y coordinate position, and then they dove on it and they, were, they dove on the vents. So we uh, simply called over and then we were all running back and forth between the NOR, uh, sending Alvin down and uh, you know, beginning to see the, the early indicators as you were coming in on, a, on, the, on the vents for these. And I'll let the biologists talk about that. I'm, I'm not gonna try to explain the biology. You got too many experts in the room for me to try to do that. But anyway, it was quite, you, you can imagine just, that wasn't supposed to be there. And I'll never forget calling back to Woods Hall. And I got, uh, first I got Howie, Howie Sanders on the phone. And I said, Howie, a uh, uh, funny thing happened on the way to the vent. Uh, we found these tube worms. He said, what? I said, there's these worms. He said, yeah, we know about worms. I said, no, this one is eight feet long. <laughs> and it's rather gory when you open it. And I'm trying to explain this to him over the radio. And he, he said, well, I said, what should I do with it? He says, first place, I want you to take a core sample every meter away from it. I said, Howard, there's no sediments here. I'm on solid bedrock. No, you're supposed to take core samples. Oh, every, I said, I, maybe with a diamond bit drill I could do it, but I can't, They're not, it's not gonna happen. It's solid rock. Hello? He, I said, now what am I supposed to do? He says, pickle it in formaldehyde. I, we don't have formaldehyde, we're geologists. <laughs> I don't, we don't have any, what's formaldehyde? You know, we don't have any formaldehyde. We had some rubbing alcohol, we sent some stuff, they don't like that, aren't they? Said, don't use that. And so we're on dry ships, right? Remember that? <laughs> when we had, I was chief scientist and I had to go around and, guys, <laughs> do you have any vodka? You know. <laughs> And I had to steal a lot. We, make, we made up this brew. I don't even remember to this day. It'd be interesting to get the first sample and see actually what we pickled that guy in. But it was, I'm sure, I know there was Jack Daniels in it. And I know, I, we, we, you know, and all I remember is the team saying, don't pick up a lot of them. Because, <laughs> uh, so, okay, so anyway. Pick up little ones, you know, like then. But anyway, it was quite, quite a remark. And this is actually a later picture comparing one of the clams from uh, 21 degrees north and one of the ones from Galapagos. But clearly, uh, this was rather, it was rather amazing because, you know, scientists tend to bore the hell out of you. And my grandmother said, talk the knob off a door. But I'll never forget everyone just sitting around speechless. That, that, to me, was probably the thing I remember the most, was looking over at Jack Corliss, Jack Diamond, John Edmund, all of them going, just shaking their heads. They just, it was like a non, a processing a nonlinear equation. You feed it in and nothing comes out. And you feed it in and nothing comes And they were just feeding it in and nothing was coming out. But it really wasn't until we brought over the first specimens that had water uh, and when we opened that water in the main lab of the NOR and we had hydrogen sulfide, then this wheel started turning. But it was pretty, pretty amazing to find these creatures. Uh, that's, I, I just want to call them creatures. But I'm going to let the biologists talk more about that over the next day. Our job is to, is to find it. And in geology, if, it's, if the samples doesn't smell, you give it to a paleontologist. If it smells, you give it to a biologist. So, and these pass the smell test. So I'll let the panel talk about where we're going. But as you know, we then went on right after that uh, in 79 and found our first uh, black smokers, which are now, as you know, rather prevalent. Uh, so I, wanna, I have a couple minutes left to just, before we take a few questions, and I'll deflect as best I can to the experts. Uh, there was a seminal moment in our return trip to Galapagos with the biologists and the first dive with Holger Janisch. I'll never forget that dive because we, being a technologist, I was working with Emory Christoph at National Geographic and RCA labs in 
Lancaster, Pennsylvania, developing the first digital uh, charge couple device camera, a CC CCD camera uh, that uh, uh, RCA was pioneering, the first digital camera. And we talked them out of one of these cameras to put into a pressure housing and put it on uh, uh, the manipulator of, of Alvin, on uh, the port side manipulator. And uh, that was then the only manipulator. But anyway, uh, so we were diving, and my job was to find a vent and hand it over. And so we, I, they were sort of upset with me because the first one I found was large clams and tube worms, and I thought that was pretty good. And they said, no, we want ones with, uh, with, with muscles. And I said, you didn't say that. <laughs> so we didn't find one of the muscles. But anyway, I'll never forget diving with Holger, and we, I was on the port side, and, and uh, Dudley Do-Right, uh, Dudley Foster was the pilot, and, 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 and Holger was on the starboard side. And we landed, and we nestled him right into the clams and mussels and tube worms and all of that. And I was playing with the manipulator with this camera. I was sort of playing with it. But it was the, the actual display for the camera was in a little four-inch display in the rack in the back of Alvin. You know, there's a rack, 19-inch rack. So I had turned my uh, body to it, and I had the controls of the minute, and I'm playing with this. And I'm looking, and then Hogers comes in on my left shoulder. And I said, well, yeah. He said, I said, well, he says, I'm looking at that. And I said, what, what do you, he says, I'm looking at that. It's better than what I'm seeing out of the porthole, because I could get it right in. And I said, let me see, we, we brought you halfway around the world. We took you down 9,000 feet. We put you in the submarine. We put you right in there, and you turn your back to the window. Yeah, this is better. <laughs> and that's for me when the light bulb went off. I went. So I actually went on sabbatical right after that cruise to, to, to Stanford. And I spent a year there uh, teaching. But that was 1979. And Silicon Valley was going ballistic. Microprocessing, digital imagery, fiber optics, everything that led on to create Silicon Valley was happening in the labs at Stanford when I was there. And it was right near my office. So I was constantly wandering over there. And I, through that, I got an, an idea. And about that time, National Geographic was writing a, 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 a seminal magazine story on the oceans. And they wanted to publish it in their December 1981 book, The Oceans. And I, I, the editor said, Bob, I want you to sit down with the, our art department and fashion your vision of where we're headed technologically. And it was that cartoon. I knew the multi-beam system existed. We didn't have it yet in academia, but it was just a function of time. My classified Navy background, I knew about the fiber optic cables that the academic community didn't know about. And I knew about charged couple device cables. So I took all of those technologies and I sat down with the art department and I said, that's, and I used the NOR, and I said, that's the way we're gonna go. And I came back and I just got tenure when engineers will actually take you seriously at Woods Hole. Uh, <laughs> Up to that moment, you're too risky. And that's when I created the Deep Submergence Laboratory. I went up to MIT to Tom Sheridan's lab, found this young engineer over here, Danny Yerger, who thought he was going to go to General Motors, I think, and make a lot of money. Totally screwed his career. <laughs> and uh, began assembling a team of people, Andy Bowen. I went out and started bringing together people that didn't exist at Woods Hole. Uh, expertise bases that did, just didn't exist here at the time. And we created the Deep Submergence Laboratory. And I said, turn that into reality. And working with engineers, I love, I got, you have two minutes. I love working with them because they underestimate how good they are. And, and they always would challenge me and I'd say, tell me the laws of physics I broke. And they, when they said, hmm, 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 no, I said, yeah, I got you. But anyway, we went on to be, build the Argo Jason system. But now, finally, in my two minutes, three minutes, I've got 
where are we now? This is my ship. I did the stupidest thing in the world. For 50, I'm, I'm 75 years old. I've been at this since 67. And I always looked in the mirror and I said, never, ever own a ship. Never, ever own a ship. And then I got a weak moment and I got this East German spy ship for nothing. And that's a long story. And uh, it's, a, it's a funny story, but don't have, maybe in the questions and answers, someone asked me how they get this East German spy ship, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, but the idea was when I look back, you know, you get old and you get reflective. And I've been at a, a, a 150 expeditions or more than that. And I looked at the most important ones weren't Titanic. That was cool, but that was a cover for military operations. And, and uh, uh, that's another question. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it was hydro discovering the hydrothermal vents. It was discovering the black smokers. We didn't know they were there. And I thought, isn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a program where the mission is to go where no one has gone before? There's a great French philosopher, I said, who's, who, who said it's by logic that you prove, but by intuition that you discover. Can we unleash the scientific community and let them be a little more intuitive and risk-taking? Well, the answer is no. So I said, well, <laughs> I never take no for an answer. So I said, well, then screw it. I'm going to do it anyway. And so I went out, got this ship, had to go create a program in the government to fund it. But anyway, uh, the, the concept of the, of the Nautilus is to go where no one has gone before on planet Earth. Uh, but it, it's, 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 I designed it to operate like the emergency room of a hospital, where you don't know what the ambulance is going to bring in at Sunday morning. And you just react. And a hospital reacts to the patient, and they keep them alive, and they get the doctors and call them in and save the patient. So the, the whole idea is that we, I promised my sponsors that if we made a discovery with this system, we would deliver the, my, the smartest brain in America to the spot of the discovery in 30 minutes. No matter where we were, no matter how deep we were, we would find the smartest person and get them down there spiritually. We move spirits. We're, this is our avatar. Uh, uh, that's our Navi, okay? Beca this is my Navi. Remember in the movie Navi in the operating room when they transferred Jake into the, into the Navi, he got up and ran because his, his legs failed him because he was, he was crippled. He couldn't run. And because he had, a, he had new legs in this creature. We, 95% of the human race lives on less than 5% of Earth. We boxed ourselves in a corner. But now, with this kind of technology, it unleashes us. So this is our vehicle systems, and we operate it with big high bandwidth satellite system. And we, we only take old farts and young people. <laughs> we do not allow anyone on Nautilus under our basic exploration program if they don't have tenure yet. Because we know if someone's going for tenure will kill their mother, and so for data. <laughs> and so. So we don't let anyone, we only need old farts. And one of the nice things about the aging of our society is that you get wisdom late and never have time to use it. But now we're getting old and we actually have time to use it. And so the idea is only let old people on there with the next generation takes, doesn't care about risk taking. And that's who's on the Nautilus. And then we need an expert, we'll call you. <laughs> and we do it through internet to level three. And we have these things all over the place. And that's when we'll allow you in the room. But we won't let you in the exploratory room because you're too focused on your research. But anyway, and then finally the comment, and now I'm done, is the use of this to energize the next generation. We call our team the core of exploration. Lewis and Clark is the core of discovery, but I made one condition that my core would be 55% women in positions of leadership and authority. And if you look at all, most of our expedition leaders are women. I'm the only old guy. <laughs> Now, now, having said that, don't go too far. 55%, that's the college population. Don't go to, um, one cruise we were up to 70, and I said, hmm, back to 55. And more importantly, I want all the faces of America on the core. A child needs to see their face, not your face, 20 years out. So I mandate that we will have the faces of our country so that everyone sees their face. I have, I have full up television production studios, thanks to National Geographic. And we do hundreds and hundreds. We did 
thousand, actually this year we'll hit maybe 600 live broadcasts to museums, aquariums, and science centers. We have interns on every watch, and we're training the next generation, and then we put them in the hot seat. We have amazing number of people cycling through the ship, and then we put them in the hot seat, and then put them out for everyone to see. So there you are. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. You'll tell me, Wayne. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Got to have a sunset shot. Uh, I'm told I didn't eat up all my time we had. You're going to tell me when to stop, right? Uh, ten minutes. Got ten minutes of questions, and if they're uh, hairy ones, I'll go to the panel. I'm, I'm a geologist. Go ahead. <laughs> Beg your pardon? <laughs> How did I get an East German spy ship? It was a really funny story. Uh, uh, Jim Newman. Jim, where are you? Jim? There's Jim. So Jim, Jim built uh, my uh, Hercules and Argus system. He's now, I couldn't find little Herc over at DSL. Where is it? Say, it okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, we were trying to find, you guys, they're upgrading one of my vehicles. So anyway, Jim, I said to Jim, I need you to go and find me a ship. And he was, did a great job, and we, we'd find a ship, and we, we, we'd bid on it, and, and we'd lose. And then we'd go find another one. And we found this, there was this East German spy ship, Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, comes up on the marketplace. East Germany's trying to you know, merge, they got to get rid of this thing. It was, I knew the ship because I naval intelligence, I knew exactly what it was. And it was a trawler. Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, so anyway, I knew the ship. And so I said, we got to get the ship. I didn't tell Jim I knew the ship. And so Jim, I, so I told Jim to go back over. You went back, or took the German guy out to, for some beers, right? He, yeah. And he, he, to find out who bought it. And he comes back and he says the guy's name was Vinny Viola. <laughs> so I went Googling away and I found Vinny Viola. He's a hedge fund guy. Actually, he was the guy that was recommended by Trump to be secretary of the army and declined. But anyway, he, but then I discovered he'd gone to West Point. And so I knew he was a, he was a billionaire, but he'd gone to West Point and I'd been in the army. And so I thought I had, to. so I, I, I called this number. And this guy answers, it wasn't Vinny, and it was the guy who said, I understand your boss just acquired this German ship. Yes. Uh, do you think I could meet with him and ask him why? And so he said, I'll call you back. And it was about five minutes later he called back. He said, yeah, he'd love to come in. Come down to the Waldorf Astoria, stand at the clock, and you know, at noon, and we'll have lunch. So I, down I went to the Waldorf Astoria, I stood next to the clock, Bing, 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 out comes Vinny. And I sat down with Vinny and I said, Mr. Violi, and I just call me Vinny. Uh, why did you acquire this East German ship? He said, well, you know, Teresa and I, the kids are out of the nest. We thought we'd get a ship, fix it up, and have some fun with it. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so... He, he said, well, why do you want it? And then, big mistake, right? <laughs> Out comes the go where no one has gone before on planet Earth. <laughs> the whole elevator speech. And it was really funny, because I, I did it briefly, believe it or not. And uh, it took him about 30 seconds, and he went, I'm ashamed of myself. I'll give you the ship. <laughs> With a little string or two on it. It was a while before he finally gave it to me. He gave it the ship. So that's how I got the ship from Vinnie Viola. <laughs> so. All right, another question. What was the second question I planted? No, there was a, no. Another question. Do you remember the second question I planted? <laughs> oh, yes, the spy mission. How? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, we lost two s submarines during the Cold War, the Thresher and the Scorpion. And one was lost coming out of Portsmouth, uh, Maine, and went down in 5,000 feet of water in near Corsair Canyon 
uh, on the seaward side of George's Bank. Uh, and then the other one was the Scorpion. The Scorpion was more onerous. The Scorpion was on war patrol uh, in the Mediterranean and was coming off war patrol and didn't show up, didn't come home. And all the wives were at the dock and the submarine didn't pull in. And so where is it? And then we were able to go back into the SOSIS data and find the implosion event, triangulate on it. Mizar was able to generally locate it. And then I was, my, when, when I went to the Navy with the Argo Jason system, I got ONR to pay for building it, but no testing. And Admiral Thunman, who was a, a, a Chief of Naval Operations for Submarine Warfare at the time, was really ticked off at Woods Hole about not being able to use the Alvin to dive on this thresher, because he requested, and they owned the submarine. And they went in with a request to use Alvin to dive on the th thresher, and were now controlled by NSF. NSF denied their request. And this sent an admiral, three striper, through the overhead. And he was really ticked that he, it was his sub and he couldn't use it. So I went to him. I knew that cr critical moment. And I said, I'll make you a deal. If you will pay me to test my vehicle system or put in your budget. And they do five-year budgets. Isn't that nice? Called POMs. Put in your next five-year POM, a budget that uses me for one month a year. And if you call me, I will be there. And I'll reschedule stuff around it. Done. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, well, I don't know. Because I'm waiting for a national emergency. I hope I never need your... He says, but while you're not doing something funny for us, um, I need, we need to better understand uh, the Thresh and Scorpion disaster. And we're particularly... We, they were thinking of getting rid of a nuclear containment vessel. We'd signed the SALT Treaty, and we had to get rid of not the reactors, the core, they would put those in existing submarine, I mean, uh, nuclear facilities, but the containment vessel in which the reactor's in is pretty big, and it's, it's, it's low grade, but it's hot. And they said they were thinking of dumping them in the ocean. And they said, why don't we go look at two worst case scenarios that are even worse than what we're thinking? The Thresh and the Scorpion not only have a nuclear containment vessel, they have nuclear reactors, and in the case of the Scorpion, they have nuclear weapons are down there. And what are they, where are the weapons, where's the reactors, and what are they doing to it? I'm only telling you because they declassified all of it. I don't have to kill all of you. Nerve gas. All the <laughs> I took the nerve gas injection before I came in the room, but anyway. Uh, so, okay. And so our job was to go out, find the reactors, and, in, and see what they were doing to the environment. We were putting fish down and catching fish to look at the the uptake of radioisotopes in the lipids of their fatty tissue with the Knowles Atomic, and we were trying to see what these guys were doing. And where are those weapons, and what are they doing, and were the bad guys ever there? So that was our mission, but we needed a cover. And I said, I've got just the cover for you. Why don't we tell the world I'm looking for the Titanic? Because the Thresher was to the west of the Titanic and the Scorpion was to the east. Had that not been the case, I would not be sitting, standing here talking about the Titanic because they funded it. But then they had to deny they funded it, which was interesting. <laughs> um, so that's how it happened. So it's a long story from there. But by the way, both reactors have scrammed. They closed their rods. They're, they're fine. And the fish have nothing in them. And the weapons are all fine. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> that... I'm not going to. One last question. It's not planted, but anyway. When you come and yell, will you best selling book about it? I'm writing it right now, and I just arrived at Woods Hole as a naval officer. So I've got a long ways to go. <laughs> so I, 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 I'm, on, I'm, I'm now, but I would say years. In fact, a lot of it I won't probably want to have out until I'm dead. <laughs> I'm writing two versions, abridged and unabridged. <laughs> one I might release while I'm alive, and the other one's definitely a <laughs> not. But anyway, uh, now we're going to have a great panel discussion. You're going to bring up our panelists.
get them. You can have my mic. You want to give this to her? Is she? He's got you. There you go. You want to give her one of those? Oh, no. Yeah, there's one on the chair. Try one on the chair. It should be on Grab, pick that up. Should be. Yell at it. No, grab the one on the chair. There you go. All right. Can you hear me now? Ah, ha. Ah. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Mindy Todd from WCAI, the NPR station, the top of Water Street. Welcome. Um, we are going to continue our conversation, uh, what we've learned and continue to learn uh, about life without sunlight. We're going to bring up our panel this one at a time um, and have them sort of answer a question as they, as they come up. Uh, and our first panelist is Mary Wojtek. She's a senior scientist for astrobiology in the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. And our question for Mary, as you come up, Mary, is what forms of energy do organisms on Earth use and what might be other ways to get energy? Come on up. Just click mine. You keep clicking. There you go. Okay. Well, um, you're a very hard act to follow. Bob, and I'm sorry it was me. If I had realized that, I would have gotten somebody else. Anyway, thank you for inviting me for being here. Um, I did just want to point out that, it, um, as was noted, 40 years ago when Bob and his crew discovered hydrothermal vents and the incredible oasis of life uh, in the deep um, sea, uh, NASA had also sent a, uh, two landers, actually, to Mars, the Viking landers, to look for alien life on another planet. And while we were up there looking for life that would be alien to us. Bob and his team actually found alien life very foreign to us and very alien to us here on Earth. And so that's also a nice uh, part of the story and, and leads to, um, I think, fits in really nicely to tonight. So I was asked to talk about how organisms on this planet get energy. And so most of us know that most of the ecosystems on Earth and most of the biomass that's produced it starts with sunlight through a process called photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide and water and the energy from sunlight. Um, can I actually let's see? No, is it working there? Can you see? Well, I'm not going to about, worry about that. We have the fixation of carbon into more complex molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids. And while this is all going on, um, it, some forms of photosynthesis in the dominant form, you produce oxygen. And in fact, oxygen was the very first pollutant on our planet because of microorganisms that evolved to uh, use this process um, to build their cells and um, populate the, the planet. Again, they were responsible for oxygen, became another source or part of a, 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 an important um, uh, chemical reactant in a way that organisms get energy. And another way that's not autotrophic or they don't make it themselves is through heterotrophy. And so oxygen with things like sandwiches end up giving us all energy. So everything that we know mostly on this planet have come as a result of photosynthesis, first in the ocean, then on land, things eating plants, we eating the things that eat plants, you know, we're all here because of um, more or less photosynthesis. But one of the things that we discovered when we discovered the hydrothermal vents with that incredible oasis of uh, uh, charismatic my uh, megafauna uh, was that it was being supported not by sunlight, things, not by photosynthesis in the surface and materials being driven down to the deep sea, but in fact by chemosynthesis happening in situ at the site. What's chemosynthesis? Instead of using the sunlight for energy, you're actually using chemical reactants. And Bob mentioned that when they opened up the sample that they had collected, they smelled hydrogen sulfide. So that's one of the first systems uh, or chemical reactants that we realized could support an entire ecosystem without any sunlight far below the surface uh, where sunlight could, could not reach. And so in the second part of the slide here, I have um, a, 
a little schematic of um, chemosynthesis happening at a hydrothermal vent and supporting all those larger organisms and allowing them to, to thrive down there well below uh, the surface of the ocean. To the right, I have a scale. So we knew that you could, this could happen with hydrogen sulfide. Basically, it can also happen with a series of other, um, chemosynthesis can happen with a series of other coupled reactions that can be um, hydrogen sulfide, as it's seen as the second one down there. You can have uh, methane being oxidized. You can have um, nitrate or nitrite, which are these nitrogen compounds here being oxidized, iron, anything that is reduced, more or less, we have discovered that microorganism, which, uh, shout out for the microbiologists out there, microorganisms rule. You know, thank you for our breath today, and also thank you for chemosynthesis and allowing those incredible communities to evolve on the seafloor. And of course, um, uh, so in this particular schematic, it's showing the amount of energy that you can receive from it. So as you go down, you're receiving more and more energy and can fuel more um, of the synthesis products that, that we now know about today. Well, so I'm from NASA. And so while um, I was originally trained as an oceanographer, I'm really interested on uh, about ocean worlds besides our own planet. So I'm just going to take a brief moment to talk about uh, ocean worlds beyond Earth. Uh, to the left of the screen, I have a, um, a picture of our ocean world, the Earth in the center, and then a series of moons uh, of Saturn, Jupiter, uh, and uh, Neptune. And they're shown to scale. And so you're going to hear a lot more uh, this evening about Enceladus, which is at the top of the, um, the screen. And I'm going to say a little bit about Europa, um, which is also one of the next destinations uh, for NASA in their search for life because of its subsurface ocean. So the, these are moons around planets that are ice covered, but because of their interaction with the mass of the planet, there's gravitational um, uh, attraction that causes tidal heating. And so beneath the surface of ice, you have actually an ocean. And if you were to add up the predicted amount of, well, add up the predicted amount of ocean water from those ice-covered moons that I've just described, you would see what you see in the, in the second panel. So that's the total amount of water on Earth, and that's the total amount of water for those tiny little ice-covered moons. So you can see that this is a lot of area for Bob to go and explore. <laughs> and probably have similar stories and getting stuck and whatnot. Now, I, we, I described what chemosynthesis is and how it supported an ecosystem on our seafloor. And when you go out to Saturn and Jupiter and Neptune, you know you're very far away from our sun. And so the likelihood that photosynthesis is a dominant process is pretty small. Um, they're not going to receive the kind of energy that they would need to actually do much with it. And it's also a very inhospitable environment on the surface of these moons. But what might come to mind, just having learned that you can have chemosynthesis below our own, you know, at the bottom of our seafloor, way below the surface where there's sunlight, might there be chemosynthesis on these uh, bodies as well? So in this final slide, in my last couple of seconds, I'm not sure how far along I am, um, I have a schematic of Europa on the left with its metallic core, its rocky interior. There's a tiny, thin water layer, and then, as I said, it was covered in ice. And our, um, um, our thoughts in, um, you know, we explore, and, and we explore with an idea about what we might find and what we hope we would find. And in Europa, what we hope we find is, is that the ice-covered surface receives a lot of radiation that actually produces oxidized forms of uh, various compounds. We're hoping that we would produce reduced compounds in the, in the um, sea floor of uh, Europa, much like are produced from our hydrothermal vents or hydrothermal systems here on Earth. And what you need for life and to fuel life is basically a battery. You need the trans, life is simply a transfer of electrons. 
And so if we can imagine the um, anode being uh, the surface of the ice and the cathode being the, the uh, subsea floor of Europa, you can form a battery that can fuel life. And that's our concept for what we might find. And so I'm assuming that the person that's coming up after is going to talk a little bit more about, uh, about how we might find uh, a chemosynthetic supported life uh, on another world in another ocean. So thank you. Our next, our, I'm sorry, it's working now. Is it work? Ah, okay. Our next panelist is a Frieder Klein, associate scientist here at HUI. He, his research focuses on sea floor hydrothermal systems. And our question for you, Frieder, is what are the links between rock, seawater, and life? Thank you. Um, all right, so um, I'm a geologist by training, and I study seafloor hydrothermal systems, in particular, uh, the interactions, the chemical interactions between rocks and water. And uh, one thing that I'm particularly interested or specifically interested in is the reactions between mantle rocks and seawater. So rocks from the Earth's mantle. And then you may wonder, if you think about it for a second, how is that even possible? Because if you look at this layer cake model of the Earth, uh, you have this big red layer, which is the mantle, and you have a brown layer, which is the crust, that is covering the mantle. So how can you have a reaction between mantle rocks and the ocean if the crust is in between? And Bob uh, nicely illustrated that on the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, or also on the, the mid cayman Rise and other places, large tectonic fault zones, where you can have mantle rocks that are being thrust up uh, by tectonic forces and then exposed to seawater. And when that happens, um, basically a chemical, a series of chemical reactions occurs that creates um, chemical compounds like hydrogen, uh, methane, CO2, and so on and so forth. And so m maybe now you're wondering why is that all important? And uh, the, the main reason is that all these chemical compounds that are dissolved in the hydrothermal vent fluids, like here from the Von Damme hydrothermal field on the mid cayman Rise, are food for microbes. And they can support microbial ecosystems in, in extreme environments um, above the seafloor, but also below the seafloor. So in my group, we study uh, the formation of, of these rocks and these chemical processes and here on the panel of the, on the left, um, this is a work in progress where we look at the formation of methane within tiny microscopic inclusions within these rocks. Um, below that is a, is a Raman image, uh, which uh, uh, evidences the, the presence of methane within these rocks. And when that methane is being released uh, from the rock, uh, it can be, uh, it can serve uh, microbes um, as a source of energy um, to make a living in, in these extreme environments. And a few years ago, we published a paper on uh, microbes that actually do live below the seafloor uh, in subseafloor mixing zones. So usually what happens is that um, you have hydrothermal fluids exiting the seafloor, uh, creating vent structures, and that's where you have these uh, chemical potential gradients that Mary was talking about, like this battery. So we have reducing fluids and oxidizing seawater. The same thing can happen underneath uh, the seafloor. So beneath the seafloor, um, that, that kind of blows our minds in that way that you can think about uh, where is life possible? It's even possible within rocks. And uh, so the implications for that are, um, for example, that the, the rocks that we're talking about here have a similar chemical composition than the rocks that, uh, as the rocks that paved the, the seafloor on early Earth. So, and, and, and the, the, the composition of these mantle rocks are also similar to the ones that we find on the rocky cores of, uh, of Enceladus and Europa. So by studying present day hydrothermal systems, we can learn about these processes that can or may support life or may have supported life um, on early Earth, but also elsewhere in the solar system. 
Thanks. Our next panelist is Chris Glein. He um, is a research scientist at Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. We're glad you could make it with all the terrible weather. Um, and our question is for Chris. Um, we heard a little bit about Enceladus. We want to hear a little bit more and why folks are so excited about it. Thank you for all coming. <clears throat> so today, sorry about that center slide there. Um, but today what I'd like to talk with you all about is the moon Enceladus, which is a small moon of Saturn. And just to give you all a sense of how small Enceladus is, if you wanted to say take a road trip around Enceladus, it'd be about the same distance as driving between Chicago and Boston. So it's not very big at all, as Mary alluded to. Um, I personally like to think of its surface, which is spectacular, as the two-face of our solar system. So you can see in this, the northern hemisphere, it looks similar to many other moons in the solar system. Very heavily cratered and battered from planetary formation processes. But as you move south, things get different, right? It gets smoother. And as you get really far south to the polar region, you see these four remarkable linear rifts which are called the tiger stripes. And we actually now know that these rifts serve as pathways for delivering materials from the interior into outer space. So you can see in this top image here, there are actually over 100 geysers that are shooting materials out at supersonic speeds into outer space. And once you get to high enough altitudes, these geysers form a massive plume of material. The gravity on Enceladus is about 1% of the Earth's gravity, so this thing is really huge, right? You can see it extends several diameters of the moon out into space. Cassini discovered the plume in 2005, and we've had many opportunities since then to study the detailed composition of the plume. In fact, we've flown the spacecraft through the plume several times now during the mission, and one of the most interesting early results is with one of our mass spectrometers, we're able to find a big sodium peak in ice grains in the plume, which provided our first clue that the source of the plume is a salty subsurface ocean. Later measurements by the Cassini confirmed that this ocean extends globally around Enceladus. It's about 20 to 50 kilometers deep, depending on where you are. And it's underlain by a core of denser rocky material. So that provides the opportunities for geochemical reactions between water and rock. And so we were excited by these possibilities and we designed a special measurement for late 2015 where we tried to look for molecular hydrogen as a key marker of water-rock interaction. And as luck would have it, we detected hydrogen in the plume shown by these red points there. And so this last image I'm showing on the right-hand side here basically summarizes our current understanding of Enceladus as being a confirmed ocean world where we have the most provocative evidence for liquid water today. And it's also providing our first tantalizing hints that not only is it an ocean world, but it's a hydrothermally active one as well. Both findings are remarkably unexpected. Thank you. Also joining our panel is uh, Chris German, senior scientist here at HUI. He specializes in exploring deep oceans for sites of seafloor fluid flow and unusual life. And our question for you, Chris, is what makes you think you could find hydrothermal vents in other ocean worlds? So I guess I'm the in-between on this panel. That when I first went to college was when Bob's first papers were coming out on the discovery of black smokers. So I'm about as old as you can be and have spent your entire life working on hydrothermal stuff because it didn't exist before then, until Bob actually found these things. Well, of course, they've been there for millions of years. Um, but then what I've been doing with my career basically has been following a lot in, in Bob's footsteps, has been wandering around the world's oceans, tricking people into funding me to go exploring for more vents in other places. So. The map on the, uh, on the left here, basically all those dots now, when I went to college, there was the Galapagos Spreading Center and there was the first black smokers on the East Pacific rise. We now know of several hundred hydrothermal vents around all the world's mid-ocean ridges so that the lines pick out the plate tectonic boundaries 
and the black dots show you places where either vents are known or whether they're suspected today. And so these in particular areas that I've been involved with, and um, in different decades, people get bored of funding me, so I have to keep coming up with different excuses to carry on doing what I'm doing or else I have to get a different career. <laughs> so in the 1990s, the, um, one of the theories, as Bob was talking about, was, well, maybe the reason we didn't find vents in the Atlantic but we found them in the Pacific was because the spreading rates were different. So plates move at different speeds. They have a different amount of volcanism um, over every, like, say, million years. Then you have more volcanism in the Pacific than the Atlantic, for example. But the flip side of that is, well, you have to wait longer at any one location on a slower spreading ridge until a vo volcanic eruption takes place. But when it comes out, most of the time, the rocks are the same. So going back to this intuition thing, I had this hunch of, well, if you just went, and now we actually know what a black smoker looks like and we know how to look for it, maybe we, if we just went back and explored a bit harder and tried a bit harder, maybe we could find these vents after all. And so that's what's showing on the right then is, we started off in the 1990s as geologists. You can see basically there's a, a black smoker vent is down here. It's about maybe the size of this lectern. But the plume that actually rises up from that could be easily as big as this room. In fact, you'd be able to smell it from Falmouth. So the actual, the hydrogen sulfide, if you know what you're doing up in the water column, you can actually trace the plume like the smoke coming out of a factory. So we started off in the 1990s as geologists saying, well, I bet we can go to really slow ridges. So we actually went back to the Azores where the Project Famous was. That was my first expedition that I led. And we went and found evidence for a bunch of hydrothermal activity. So we said, well, we know it's in here somewhere. We can smell it in the water columns. It's, there's going to be vents down there if you just go look, uh, if you drive around long enough and you'll find some. And then went, and people said, okay, so you found them on slow spreading ridges, but what about really slow spreading ridges? I bet you can't find it on really slow spreading ridges. So then we went to the Indian Ocean and did the same thing again and said, no, there's going to be stuff there. So that was the 1990s. They said, okay, so we don't need to fund you to go look at any other plate tectonic boundary any, ever again. You can go study climate change and, you know, redirect your moral compass and worry about things that are really important to society today. Um, and then I was saved by a, a friend, a, a marine biologist, Paul Tyler, who a lot of the people in the audience today will know well, who was working with me. I was still in the UK at the time. And there was a new program spun up called the Census of Marine Life. And part of that, um, a lot of the people that are here for the, the conference that's on this week got interested in why it was that the animals at different vent sites were different from each other. If I just like, you know, if I can summarize all of marine geology and marine chemistry in about two sentences, we can say everything that happens at mid-ocean ridges, there's one kind of rock, and then there's a 3.5% salt solution that gets pumped through that rock. And so the chemistry that comes out of vents should always be the same everywhere. So then you'd expect that the animal should be the same everywhere as well, but they're not. We've found hundreds of different species new to science, and they vary from one ocean basin to another. And we didn't understand why. And most of the reason we didn't understand why is because we didn't know where the vents were in most of those oceans. So that's what I ended up doing in the, in the 2000s, was I managed to like, retread myself as a, a friend of marine biologists and get to carry on exploring the world's oceans <laughs> and go to different places people had never been. So all through the Southern Ocean, for example, nobody had been stupid enough. Bob's generation did really pretty well. They kind of like, they cornered the tropical Pacific and the tropical North Atlantic, and they went to all the good places, and then they left all the other places that were further south. So, <laughs> so I ended up... I've ended up running away from typhoons south of Madagascar. I've been to the Scotia Ridge. I've been, to, I've been with Russians to uh, Svalbard on the Sunday where the bar was only open for an hour. That was sufficient. Um, and so by the end of 2010 of the Sense of Marine Life program, uh, we'd basically been everywhere apart from there was one bit of unfinished business was the Arctic. Nobody had actually been to the Arctic and worked out how to find vents under the ice. And so the trick to how we got efficient during that, um, the 1990s was it was no longer good enough to know that there were vents on the seafloor somewhere. We had to actually go find them. And if you want to understand what's living there, you'd better get a photograph of the biology. It's no good just having a map. And so that was one of the things we did with Dana Yoga in particular. I think Bob had softened him up so hard that uh, he, he no longer thought anything was a stupid idea anymore. So he said, well, how about we take your brand new prototype robot and now we get to fly that around without a wire, without any humans in the loop, and just have it autonomously flying around on the seabed and tracking vent sites to source and taking photographs. So we ended up doing that in all those different weird and wonderful ocean basins. And when that wasn't good enough, we said, okay, now let's go do that with ice in the way as well. So that's what I've been doing since 2010. And it's kind of cool, on the left here is, um, on the center picture at the top, that's my colleague Antje Botius, who a lot of you will know, a marine microbiologist from Germany. So she's the person that really um, had faith in us and actually has lined up icebreaker time over the last five, 10 years, has been taking us back to the Arctic to see whether we couldn't actually track vent sites down to source. 
So on the left is effectively the first photograph of a black smoker found under the ice in the Arctic. And because Antje is famous like Bob, she carries around her own private television crew as well. So in fact, we actually have, that's the actual moment when we actually found the black smoker. So you can see the black smoker on the screen, and we actually have the point of like, that's the black smoker we've been looking for. Two hours from the end of that cruise. Um, and then those of you who know Paul Tyler or were part of that committee, there was me and 23 biologists on this Census of Marine Life Committee looking for vents and seep biology around the planet for a decade. And like Bob was alluding to, Paul's lecture to me was always, OK, Chris, you're here to find the vents. And then when you find them, step back and let the grown-ups take over. <laughs> so having, this is the moment where I found the, like, the last vent site in the last ocean basin. I hadn't found vent site yet on Earth. So that's the time to step back. And uh, well, better way to get out of the biologist's way than just head off to some other planets and go, we We'll go look for vents there instead. <laughs> now we're going to um, throw out a few questions and let the panel kind of answer some questions before we um, ask you to share some of your questions with us. Um, I'm going to start with uh, what roles do chemosynthetic microbes play on today's Earth beyond deep sea vents, and are they globally relevant? Go first. Um, Here, I'll give you mine too. You can have two. Oh, thank you. I think I'll just take them all. Yeah. All right. <laughs> One of those has to work. Does this make me look more important? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, chemosynthetic bacteria are very important. They're small, but they do a lot. Or they, they represent a fairly small proportion of the bacteria on Earth, but they perform some very important functions. My own um, specialty in graduate school was looking at nitrifying bacteria. And this was, um, it's a very hard way to make a living in general being chemosynthetic as opposed to being a plant or being photosynthetic. But they're responsible for uh, a significant part of the uh, nitrogen cycle that completes that nitrogen cycle. So we get um, all the forms that we need uh, for organisms. Um, Chemosynthetic organisms are also uh, responsible for producing some of the strongest greenhouse gases. So one of the um, nitrifying bacteria can form nitrous oxide, which is a very strong absorber. Um, chemosynthetic bacteria also form methane, which is another much stronger than, than CO2. Both of those uh, chemicals uh, contribute to, to global warming, which does exist. And uh, even though I'm from Washington, um, uh, so I, those are two of the ones that are my favorite contributions to um, uh, to the, the global geochemical cycles. And I will say that although we focused on the fact that they occur and, and can support ecosystems beneath the surface of the sea far away from sunlight, they're present everywhere and they do all sorts of things, including uh, one bad thing that they do in New England is nitrifying um, bacteria actually erode a lot of your old um, headstones. So it will dissolve the materials that make up many of the headstones in, in um, uh, graveyards and cemeteries in the Northeast. So that's something less, well, none of those are particularly great. But anyone else have anything else they'd like to say? <laughs> they eat rocks. Yeah, they eat rocks, yeah. I mean, I guess the other thing is just that they can occur in lots of different, as you were saying, they can occur in a lot of different places, right? We've been talking tonight about hydrothermal vents on mid-ocean ridges, but there's lots of other different geologic settings where the rocks and the fluid can interact. So the kinds of reactions that uh, Frida's been talking about could occur in other places, like the bottom of subduction zones at the other end of the, the plate tectonic cycle, for example. So, um, you know, I think that's when it comes to trying to explore for the similar things in space. We don't actually know what the geology is going to be like on the seafloor yet. So we have to, like, the more we can explore on our own planet and learn about the diversity of geologic settings, the more we can learn about the different kinds of places that could sustain life. And, uh, yeah, we need to try and keep as open-minded as we can. So the more we explore on Earth, it helps. I'd like to add to that, that um, chemosynthetic bacteria, one of the most primitive uh, organisms on Earth. And um, it's very likely that, that these organisms existed on early Earth. And... Uh, I mean, there's a reason why we are all here, because we're related to these organisms, right? So I think that's a fundamentally important thing to consider. And we have a very big impact on global geochemical cycles nowadays. I mean, maybe a little far-fetched, but you see the, the point that I'm trying to make. Um, we're microbes. Yeah, we're, we're all microbes. Mostly microbes. <laughs> 
Is everybody, I think, um, are you all in agreement that we will find life elsewhere? Everybody pretty much, you all agree. Yep. Absolutely. So, so give me your thoughts on where you think that might be and why. <laughs> I think it's throughout the universe. I, my, my question is, when we find it, so we go to Europa, we fly by Enceladus with our mouth open, and we ingest uh, chemosynthetic bacteria. What's next? I want to get past it's there. Now what? Because what I, I'm also worried about how violent... See, what we're not introducing in a lot of this is how violent are those oceans? Uh, you, you, you spoke about the power of that geyser. I mean, as an engine, with a little engineering background, uh, what, is the, what is the Sea of Europa like? Is it, if it's violent enough through uh, gravitational distortion to squeeze the planet back and forth and generate uh, uh, volcanic eruption, that's a pretty nasty process. What do you, how violent is the circulation system in the ocean? And is there a lot of slush in there and that would eat an AUV in a nanosecond? <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in? <laughs> yeah, so I'm actually a little bit in disagreement. I'm, my answer is I don't know. Um, I think I can agree that we're going to, as scientists, we're going to try our hardest to figure out if life is out there. But really one of the fundamental difficulties is we only have a sample of one. So it's difficult to say, well, how easy or how difficult, how long might it take for life to originate on a planet? What I find most fascinating about places like Enceladus and Europa is that some of these hypotheses for how life started on the Earth revolve around hydrothermal processes. So they offer these great testing grounds for many of the fundamental concepts that are being advanced to try to explain the origin of life. And that is starting to move that field from more of a speculative science to something more empirical. And I find that very uplifting for this century of exploration. I'm going to add to that that I find it almost certain that we'll find life, mainly because now when you go out and look up in the night sky, instead of just seeing a series of stars, you're looking at a series of solar systems. Only, almost every star we have looked at has had at least one and usually several planets orbiting it, and many of them are in the, in the so-called habitable zone. So they're, they're at a distance from the star to get, gain energy without being fried or without, uh, and, and at a distance that would allow potentially to have water on the surface. So I don't think we just have a few icy moons to consider or Mars along with it. I think we have billions and billions and billions of planets out there that are going to be at least positioned correctly to have a similar scenario to what we had here on Earth. And I'm, it's likely, I personally don't think life is necessarily that uh, special in its origination, its chemistry. Uh, it certainly took some time to get it right, but I think that that could certainly happen somewhere else. Go ahead. Can I, I guess one thing I want to add to that. And there are ocean worlds everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Is the, the cool thing about, if you look at the Earth's history, is that although the, the Cambrian explosion where all the complex life like us came from is really quite recent, it's in like the last 10% of the planet's history, that the first evidence for single-celled microbes came around ridiculously fast. So it's, you know, if, again, extrapolating wildly from one data point of Earth to the universe, it would say, okay, maybe there were like the three billion boring years between when there were microbes to when there was something that was two cells was like, you know, that, that suggests multi-celled life is really difficult. But conversely, you might argue that single-celled life is a trivially easy thing to actually come into existence. So then that's, that recognition, I think, is coupled with the fact that we're celebrating 40 years of vent discovery here, but it's only like 20 years. If you went back 20 years, there was only one data point for how many planets had oceans in this solar system. So I think that's the other thing that's been really interesting in the last 20 years is realizing that there are other oceans with rocky seafloors that could host things like hydrothermal vents in our own solar system. It suddenly made this, instead of being an abstract thing of, are we alone and is there life out there? You don't just have to be listening to um, like SETI satellite dishes and you don't have to worry about interstellar travel of getting to the next star, that it actually could be right here in places that NASA's already been to. So places like Saturn and um, Jupiter have been within humanity's reach for 40 years with the Voyager expeditions. So it's kind of cool that it's actually a tractable thing, that if life really is that easy to come into existence from water-rock interactions, 
we have a host of, you know, more than, more than just Europa and Enceladus, there's a, there's a family of places we can go test that in the lifetimes of people in this room here. So that's kind of a cool thing that we haven't had available to us. Mm -hmm. um, it comes back to this thing of, you couldn't have written an NSF proposal to predict that 20 years ago. Um, it was just a hunch, but some people followed some hunches and we're in a pretty sweet place right now. Um, I'm going to ask one more question before we open it up to the audience. Um, Bob, you talked a lot about the technology and even that National Geographic, where we were going. Um, so what do we still need, what, what needs to be developed to get us to where we need to be? I've never had that as a problem. Um, clearly, it's it's... How you, you know, the, the, the name of the game in exploration is bottom time. Uh, how, how rapidly can we make things extremely cheap to be able to have a tremendous amount of systems out there as a pack dogs? I mean, more and more we get AUVs smaller, cheaper, and solve the problem of energy uh, we just need to have an amazing number of critters out there. I, I see most of where we're headed is completely all robotic, uh, using the energy of the oceans as we best can harness the energy of the oceans to accelerate our exploration, whether it's currents, whether it's methane seed, wh whatever way we can, we can, we can harness some the energy issue and the best way is to have very tiny things, nanotechnology, you know, where you're just having an outrageous amount of things that are floating around in every circulation system you can imagine gathering data. So I think it's all, I haven't seen a whole lot of nanotechnology entering the oceanographic community. I'm sure it is. Maybe some of the engineers here could speak for that, but I've certainly seen it in outer space. I've certainly seen it in a lot of, in medicine and other areas, but I haven't really seen nanotechnology making its impact in our field. I think one, one big issue right now is that um, there's no um, vehicle that can reach the deepest trenches of our planet Earth. Um, so we, we lost uh, Nereus uh, a few years ago. And I think it's, it's really important to, to convince the general public that ocean exploration is important and that there's, there's a lot of things that we can discover uh, if we have the right tools, right? And so I think a full, full ocean depth uh, vehicle is extremely important, whether it's manned or unmanned. I just go for t the 98 I get at 6,000 meters. Uh, okay. You can go after the remaining 2%. Yeah, maybe that's where the really exciting stuff well, could is. Be, so I'm gonna, but, yeah. it's, it's time you got disagreed with, right? It's that time of the evening. So, um, so one of the things, one of the reasons of why would you go after the other 2% of, of our oceans is um, one of the things Mary was pointing out was if she, when she showed you that cross section of Europa, the, the little thin blue strip of water is actually about 200 kilometers deep. Now, it turns out that because Europa is not as big as Earth, then the gravity is about six times smaller. But even so, the pressure at the bottom of Europa is about 16 kilometers deep. So in fact, if we only learn how to do stuff at 6,000 meters on Earth, that'll be great for our own planet. But if you actually want to go and explore those other places, we actually need to develop the tradecraft of how do we have vehicles that work under those deep pressures. But the pressure is about the same, isn't it? No, it's about double. I thought so when you, no, and Enceladus is Celsius. like Hawaii. Yeah, oh, I, thought, is okay. I thought the pressure at Celsius is about the same, but Europa is in, what's Europa, the... Europa, the only place you can replicate the Europa pressure is yeah. at the bottom of the deep trenches. So in fact, there's a... And there's some cool things. There was just a thing... Right, we're in an audience full of biologists, so we'll probably hand... We'll throw the microphone out into the audience pretty soon about this, but there was just a thing on Japanese television this week about the deepest diving fish that have been filmed at about 8,000 meters. But as I understand it, there's something about what happens beyond that pressure where stuff doesn't work. Mm. Proteins, right? That, uh, there's, there's something about, basically, there's, there's a pressure effect that life as we know most of it in most of the oceans wouldn't actually exist below about 8,000 meters. If you go to deeper pressures, then other stuff, there must be special adaptations going on. So in fact, there's mysteries in our own planet. Um, and I guess the other thing I'd go back to in technology, though, is, is something that isn't specific to those depths, although that's, that's a key thing that we don't know how to do routinely. The other one is just actually having robots that can actually swim around an ocean and make the measurements and do intelligent things without having a phone home. At the moment, we're still very reliant on vehicles that have to stay very close, need to have a support ship with them all the time. 
And if you think it's hard getting a robot to an ocean world in space, then trying to get a research ship to an ocean world in space will be <laughs> even harder. That's going to be some pretty serious heavy lifting. So, so the more, exactly as Bob was saying, you can put the sort of nanotechnology of putting in situ sensors and actually having vehicles that can not only make smart measurements, you don't have to take the samples, it can do the measurements there in the field for you and send you the data. But then sometimes we can actually make the decisions. One of the things we've been discussing is on Europa, for example, it's about an eight hour round trip for a radio message at the speed of light, whereas for Mars, it's five minutes. So at the moment, if you have a rover driving around on the surface of Mars and it finds something unexpected, it can just stop and put on the park brake and phone home and ask for instructions. And if you did that in Europa, then by the time you actually sent the message up to the surface and back to Earth and then back out again, then you stand around and say, yeah, yeah, stop exactly where you are. <laughs> and uh, that was really good. And the robot will phone back and say, yeah, there's been a current blowing. So I've actually been moving for the last eight hours and I'm no longer where I was where you said I should stop where I am. So, so the more that the vehicles can actually make intelligent decisions and actually send the information and do the work for us. And, you know, if that could happen, when I started, um, when I moved to Woods Hole 10 years ago, one of the famous things we had, we, had, we wrote a review paper of where we knew vents were and we'd studied 10% of the world's mid-ocean ridges. And 10 years on, we just recently uh, published a new review paper and we said, oh, now we know what's happening on 20% of the world's ridges. That's not all the rest of the world's seafloor, that's just that part. So by the time I'm about 130, we should have finished the ridge exploration at current rates of progress. So if we could actually switch that across and have robots doing it and have fleets of robots going off and doing that stuff, that would be kind of handy for Earth as well. And if the NASA people could make advantage of it for ocean worlds, then that's a bonus. How about questions from the audience? I think we have some microphones out here, right? We'll go right over here, this woman, lady over here has her hand up on the, with the blue jacket on the far end. I have a question on your studies on the methane coming out of the vents. Are you finding it to be a constant level or is it increasing? And if so, how will it affect hurricanes? Um, so the, the concentration of methane seems to be actually very constant. And, and that is something that has surprised us um, and you know, made us wonder what the underlying processes are that, that cause the formation of uh, methane. I believe Jeff Seewald is here in the audience here. He and I are working on that pro uh, problem, trying to figure out what the source is. Um, so the, the, it seems that the, the source of the methane, or one of the main sources of the methane in the hydrothermal vents in, uh, in what we call ultramafic hosted or systems that are hosted in mantle rocks um, is, is these uh, fluid inclusions that, uh, where the methane forms through the reaction of hydrogen and CO2. Um, that process takes a long time and um, these uh, little inclusions act as little micro reactors. So uh, that's what we believe is uh, possibly the main source of the methane and ethane and other hydrocarbons in these vent systems, particularly the, the ones that are in the, uh, hosted in the uh, mantle rocks. And the connections to hurricanes, to be honest, uh, I think there's no connection there um, because the concentrations are relatively low. Uh, they can support uh, microbial ecosystems with chemical energy, but they are not, um, let's say, we don't know enough about these systems and how widespread they are, whether they can impact um, our atmosphere. I can tell you that in our recent explorations, uh, the sonar system that we have on the Nautilus can see uh, gas in the water column. And a lot of the previous people would just gate out the water column uh, and not look at it. And we're now uh, finding hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of methane seeps off the Oregon, Washington, and California coast. Peter Gerg is sitting right there. I mean, I, I've been amazed at the number of methane seeps that we have found and in a fraction of looking. And so uh, those are not related to a, geoth uh, uh, to a hydrothermal vent system. That's really coming off the, the continents. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm just dumbfounded by how many we've seen to then extrapolate it globally. It's, it's a big source that I've never seen in a lot of atmospheric modeling. And it's huge. 
Yeah, but that source is, a, it's a, as you said, it's a different source. Correct. Yeah. But it's, it's a lot of methane. It's a lot, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that may actually impact our climate. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience? Right down here. Hi. I was just wondering if um, anyone is um, studying or what the um, medical uh, implications are of the studying of um, uh, chemosynthetic microbes and possible uh, symbiotic relationship with photosynthetic beings, and uh, wouldn't that be a, another source of funding? <clears throat> Maybe even for a good purpose, too. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? I'm aware of it. I mean, there has been one antibiotic isolated through hydrothermal vent research. I know of one example of that. That um, I think it was about two years ago, we were having a, a forum on ocean exploration in Baltimore, and that was it. There was two things I read on, I mean, this is just me reading the BBC News website rather than what I knew from <laughs> hydrothermal research, but there was two things that came out on the same day, and one was that they were talking about how pig farmers in China had... Exactly to your point, pig farmers in China had been using antibiotics so much that they'd finally found something that could basically overcome even the last antibiotics that were being held in reserve for medical research. And then there was a, you know, a paper came out saying, oh, we think we've actually pursued this to this point where we could actually generate a new antibiotic previously yeah. unavailable. And it was like, oh, yeah, so that's kind of a neat thing to remember next time somebody says they want to go mine all the vent sites on the seafloor. That may not be the most valuable thing. It may actually be if you can actually, like, you know, the, the medical components. And I think it comes down to the fact that we haven't found most of the vent sites that exist. And every time we find new vent sites, we find new species at a rate of discovery of about one every two weeks for the last 40 years. And we're still discovering more. Um, so, yeah, I think there's huge untapped potential out there. Yeah, and I'm just a planetary scientist here. But the most famous example I can think of is the isolation of DNA polymerase from a Yellowstone hot spring, which led to a huge industry. You raised your hand up right here. Uh, yes. Hang on, the microphone's uh, coming I, to you. I don't need one. <laughs> uh, he did the work. The, huh? Take it anyway, make her yeah. feel good. All right, there, there we go. <laughs> so the, now, fix, the I, folks I listening at home. Completely off base, and this, is a con this could be a concept that's generally considered old hat, I don't know. Um, I've heard from many different sources that Theoretically, life on Earth began at hot springs deep in the ocean floor. Is there foundation for that, or what's the consensus on that concept? So the ocean's been around a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can speak to, there are multiple theories for the origin of life, and they're based on um, the ability for a particular environmental scenario to produce um, energy that could be used, or particular uh, biochemically important compounds. Um, and so certainly that is one theory. There's also a theory that originated uh, in ice grains or ice veins. Um, you need a system that can actually create a gradient. You need a system that can um, concentrate uh, for some of the reactions that led to the emergence of life to occur. Um, but we have to keep in mind that, in, that well, as, so I'm going to play my trump card as the head of the astrobiology program, and, and that is, it seems to me that, you know, we had 400 million years on this planet with a cha at, during which period the environmental condition changed pretty seriously, and I don't believe that, that life happened like that in a single spot, and so I think all of these scenarios contribute to some aspect of what was needed for life to emerge. Uh, and certainly, hydrothermal vents played an important role. They set up a nice gradient. They, they, there's a thermal gradient. There's a chemical gradient. There's a lots of really wonderful things about uh, hydrothermal vents for, for producing things that are necessary for life. Yeah, I would add to that that um, there are certainly hypotheses about uh, the origin of life, that the origin of life is found or in hydrothermal systems that did exist on early Earth. Uh, we find um, in the rock record that uh, rocks are being or were hydrothermally altered that are really, really old. Um, the Iswa formation in Greenland is about 3.8 billion years old. And uh, it it's, uh, underwent a process that we call serpentinization. And, and that serpentinization reaction or process generates hydrogen and can reduce uh, CO2 to organic compounds. So that's what we call 
abiotic organic synthesis. So you have the, the reaction of inorganic material to organic material. So you can call that prebiotic synthesis to some extent. But then the big question is that no one really knows how to answer, and there are several models out there, who, people who try to answer that question. How do you get from prebiotic synthesis to life that is self-replicating? So there are like lots of unknowns that are um, yeah, really exciting to be figured out. There are even point. smaller steps than yeah. that big leap that oh, we yeah, still yeah, don't understand. Well, yeah, like, yeah. But to, yeah. I mean, to, to show how the science has evolved, the first time I got asked that question by a newspaper 20 years ago, I actually said, or 25 years ago, I said, anybody who tells you that life originated at hydrothermal vents is a charlatan. Because the kind of vents we knew at the time were missing a key thing. One of the things Frieda was just talking about, and in fact, when Chris and Frieda were introducing themselves, they were talking about hydrothermal vents that are rich in hydrogen. And we just didn't know any seafloor vents on bare rock settings in the 1990s that were rich in hydrogen. So they kind of missed this fundamental gap of what conditions had to be like in Earth's early history. And the modern day vents mostly aren't like that. It's only in the last more recent years that we've actually, as we've looked in more and more obscure places, we found different weirder kinds of hydrothermal vents and now we've actually found we do actually have systems that are rich in hydrogen and so now we can actually start seeing these things. So I've actually completely changed direction of whether I believe in it or not because we've actually made the discoveries now to say, okay, we've actually found things now that are still alive, that are still active today, that are more like what the vents on the, the earliest Earth seafloor must have been like and then we can actually study those things and that's what these guys do is saying that actually that chemistry does work, that the the theory can now be tested and we can actually find the right things happening. So at least we're not missing that block. And as, as Mary said, there's like a whole bunch of stuff there of like, this is where the magic happens, <laughs> where you go from geology to life. But, but if you didn't actually have the right geology and the right chemistry to start with, you could never have done that out those other steps. So we've at least filled in two tiny little ratchet point steps along the, along the path. Yeah, and I, I just like to echo Mary's point is, one really convenient thing about this universe we live in is there are a lot of planets. So let's say if someone thinks that having dry land is very important, well then Mars might be a place that we wish to really thoroughly explore for evidence of the origin of life or hydrothermal vents on the ocean worlds. So if you think you need plate tectonics, maybe you need to go to a super earth or some other earth-sized planet in a different system. So there's a lot of different properties and knobs that are being turned at different spots in the universe. Yeah, I'd like to add, add to that that, um, like this week, there's the symposium on chemosynthetic uh, um, organisms, and and these chemosynthetic organisms evolve over geologic time, right? So it's important to try to go back in time and see how these microbes evolved, and and you can do that by by studying systems that are older and older and older. And there are studies where um, well, people are looking at ancient DNA. So you're, we're starting to be able to look into the evolution of these primitive ecosystems. So that's not answering how life emerged, but that's how answering, or possibly answering how life evolved uh, in these systems. Yeah, we could have the last question right here. Just with regard to the plumes of an Enceladus, uh, is there a possibility or even a plan to be able to sample those and return those samples to Earth for study? Oh yeah, there are all sorts of plans <laughs> being drawn up. Um, <laughs> probably the, the nearest term plan is NASA opened up a competition for their medium class New Frontiers missions, and there are two proposals I'm aware of that were submitted that would basically provide much more detailed characterization of the organic chemistry. And there are, there are much cooler missions later on down the road where you can imagine sending a lander and sticking your tongue out if you're a machine and tasting the snowfall. It's literally snowing on Enceladus from the plume. And then very ambitious things would be like what Chris wants to get into is where we could send something crawling down the crevasses of these tiger stripes or eventually going into the subsurface ocean and exploring deeper into the ocean and towards the sea floor. So these are all things that range from near term or sort of science fiction, depending on your time frame. Yeah. I was gonna say, I don't wanna be a Debbie Downer, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but much of this system that we're talking about is very difficult to imagine sampling. I mean, these geysers by the time, um, you know, those of you in the, in, in the audience that are oceanographers, would you like to sample 
from someplace in the middle of the ocean that spewed water from that point into a giant geyser hundreds of kilometers above. Does that seem like an ideal sam sampling opportunity? This is a giant spray. It's shooting out at fantastic speeds. Um, this is not trivial. You know, you, can't, you put your tongue out and the particles will go right through it. You know, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's nasty business thinking about doing it. And there's also the whole issue, anyone who's done any sampling, if there's a lot of life, um, well, I'll take this opportunity to, to point out one thing. The easiest way to sample for life is if there's lots of it. And, and it's very likely that at a minimum, if there is life in Enceladus, there isn't very much of it. Uh, Chris is on a, uh, was on a team that found a lot of hydrogen. And that's like, that's, uh, you know, and we've actually had this discussion before, um, finding a lot, of, a lot of hydrogen and expecting that that is an indication of life. It's simply an indication of food, and it's sort of like pizza out in a graduate student department. <laughs> if it's still laying on the table a day later, or even five minutes later, it's then there a, aren't any graduate students not there. not edible. <laughs> well, it's not edible. Right? No, well, actually, I know graduate students. It would be right. eaten. But um, I, so the point would be that, you know, based on the, the chemistry that we've seen from the plume, it's not likely, there may not be life at all, and if it is, there'd be very little. So it would be a real challenge to sample it. Every every geyser I've been around has stuff around the geyser. Isn't it less violent to sneak up on the to do it where it where it's around the geyser and not going through it? Up to land and collect. Yeah. Again, I think it's actually the stuff that rains down would be pretty diffuse. Yeah, or, or the way back down. I mean, I think I think the key thing to answer your question, Mary, is that's where oceanographers have a lot to to offer, right? So you say because because Enceladus has already been sampled in that the, the Cassini spacecraft has flown through it and has made measurements of that stuff. I mean, that's what Chris has been working on for the last few years. Um, and there's a very good chance that there's similar plumes on Europa, and the new James Webb Space Telescope that's getting launched in January is going to actually, one of the first things it's going to do is check that out. So the next missions that go to Europa will have pretty much the same payload that the Enceladus mission has. Sure, but then that's the question remote becomes, sensing, though. But then I, the question becomes sample collection. But the question then yes. becomes, well, but then, so that's one of the things, is why would you want to take samples if you could just develop the technology that could make the measurement anyway? The only reason we take samples is because we can bring them back to a lab because we don't know how to make the measurements more cleverly. And the first time I went to see you, one of my uh, advisors said, for chemical oceanographers are never going to catch up with geophysicists till you come home with the data instead of the samples. Because if you spend if you spend the whole of grad school generating like I did 48 data points over three years, that's a lot less than if you go to sea for 30 days, come home with all your data in ones and zeros, and then you can do everything. And that's exactly what Bob's telepresence hinges on. If you can do everything digitally and actually send the data, then you don't even have to be there yourself anymore. You can do a lot of other things. But another part is if what nature gives you is a jet of seawater being evacuated into space, and that's what you can get e access to easily in the first 10 years rather than waiting 40 years, then the smart thing is to work out, so what would that be telling you? Because you can get the data, so then the hard part is then the interpretation. So that's a really cool thing. I don't know what happens if you evacuate seawater into space, but I could set up an experiment with a vacuum and I could actually take some seawater and put some microbes in it and run that experiment, and that's a lot cheaper than sending the spacecraft up there. So, you know, for, for quite a lot of money. And, and the same thing becomes back to Bob's thing of how violent is the ocean churning on one of these planets? Yeah. We can actually think about, well, okay, well, what do we know about plate tectonics and what drives, you know, there's lots of pe that people understand from Earth of how the seafloor geophysics works and they understand how physical oceanography works. So there's no reason why you couldn't take the same principles and apply them and do quite a detailed, thoughtful, theoretical study, which would actually tell you, well, if there was a vent there, then, then the chemical staining from that or the microbes from that would get sloshed through the entire ocean and they would get right up to the top. So if your crack opens up like this, under certain circumstances, that's what will get jetted out into space. You may get microbes from the seafloor out into space. Or you might not. You may get some other layered system where the microbes from the deep sea never get up to the surface. But I've, and, and I think that's, those are, you might think for Earth's oceans, you know the answer to that question. And you might well be wrong. I mean, I spent most of my career saying the reason that I spend all my time designing, you know, working with engineers here at Woods Hole to get robots that hug the seafloor and go looking for hydrothermal vents is because that's the only place they are. And then after I've been doing that for 25 years, I ran an expedition across the Pacific in 2013, and the net outcome from that was that 30% of all the carbon dioxide that's pulled down by life in the Southern Ocean 
is actually fueled by iron from hydrothermal vents that does actually make it all the way to the surface. The, the, the iron doesn't just come out and precipitate in minerals and all the black mineral deposits you see. There's a tiny fraction of that iron gets out, but that's enough to actually drive as a, a limit to, to pr biological productivity in the surface ocean that it's an essential nutrient. So, so we have evidence from our own planet, but it's only three or four years old, that little things happening on the seafloor, out of sight and out of mind, are actually driving large parts of our own life on our own planet. So why shouldn't it work on other planets too? Yeah, and I'd just like to add the comment, not to sound too cliche, small steps is what we should be taking. I think there's a risk of trying to go for broke when we're landing on Europa or trying to catch plume samples at Enceladus. And Cassini has provided our first reconnaissance of Enceladus, but I think it's really critical to try to understand the geological and chemical and physical context of what's going on there, you know, like the processes that are responsible for these compositions, rather than saying directly, we're gonna look for these detailed signs of cells in the first mission. If you look at the Mars program, it's a very sustained effort at getting ever closer to the life question without saying the next mission has to find life. And I think that's a real risk if that's something we're gonna to try to do for the ocean worlds. Uh, great way to end it. Let's thank our panelists, Bob Ballard, Mary Boyd, <laughs> Thank you.